future and uh, what we think we're going to do about those challenges. Um, I came to the missile defense mission uh, just a few years after President Reagan uh, challenged the nation to uh, look at ways that we might solve the problem of uh, defending our nation against uh, ballistic missiles as opposed to avenging our nation. And, uh, and so I came back uh, as a young uh, rocket propulsion engineer from the Air Force with about 130 of my compatriots, I see several of them here in the audience today, uh, with the goal of sponsoring uh, research uh, and, and really capitalizing on the creativity and the innovation in our industry, uh, in our academia, in our national laboratories to go after that challenge. So we made a bet in those days, I think it was on the order of about uh, $2 billion or so a year in uh, research, research in a broad spectrum of uh, technologies and, and areas uh, that would uh, hopefully pay off uh, down the road and get us that sort of capability. And so there was a great focus uh, broadly, uh, that's an interesting term, great focus broadly on, on those technologies which might, uh, might pay off in the future for us. Um, some of those didn't pan out. Uh, some of those did uh, much better than others. We, we were looking at a lot of things. As you might recall, we were looking at, uh, uh, you know, at nuclear pumped lasers. We were looking at uh, micro, uh, high powered microwaves. We were looking at rockets. We were looking at, of course, in my own case, we were looking at electromagnetic rail guns, uh, giant uh, uh, 100 ton uh, satellites that would uh, launch uh, small projectiles at uh, 20 kilometers per second at a, uh, at a rain of 10,000 or so uh, reentry vehicles coming in. So, um, as I mentioned, the $2 billion or so uh, we spent now, I think, uh, those first uh, six or seven years eventually uh, uh, paid off in some. Uh, in some areas, and we got more focused after a desert storm at looking at how we might apply these technologies uh, to defend uh, our, against missiles uh, in the theater, as well as against our nation. And uh, I want to take one of those examples, one that I worked on in particular, to, uh, to walk you through how we built that foundation and where we're going to head to, I think, here in the, in the next few years. In the early to mid age and eighties, rather, uh, the uh, Army's Ballistic Missile Defense Command, and now I think is a Strategic Missile Defense Command, was looking at uh, ways to uh, apply hit-to-kill technology to destroy an incoming RV, and so they they built an experimental set uh, called the Homing Overlay Experiment, in which they launched using essentially ICBM rocket motors a very large about the size of a refrigerator, uh, kill vehicle, and an incoming RV, and they had success. But we recognized that that would be a challenge for us in the future, and so for things like the electromagnetic railgun, we were talking about launching projectiles of about a kilogram that were the size of a bread box. So we needed to significantly miniaturize that capability if we were going to get to, uh, to that uh, to realize that sort of um, uh, capability in the future. Now, over time, I didn't get to a kilogram or the size of a bread box, but we did reduce the size of those projectiles down to about six kilograms or so and a little bit larger than a bread box. Uh, the electromagnetic railgun technology didn't come along very well in that same time frame, but we recognized that by applying these projectile technologies to some of our, uh, uh, some of our existing systems, uh, like, uh, for example, the uh, standard missile system in the Navy, we could change anti-aircraft missiles into uh, ballistic missile defenders. And so this standard missile three that we have in the field today is essentially uh, the grandson of that uh, technology that we invented in the 80s and the early 90s. And the foundation for the systems that we have today are primarily based on that investment that we made in, in, the, in that time frame. So as we look at the system uh, that uh, General Todorov described here uh, earlier today and look at what do we need to do in the future to make our ballistic missile defense systems more capable, I think there's two, two key areas that we want to focus our attention on. Uh, one is to uh, reduce 
the number of shots that we take at each credible object. Now, I'm not going to discuss in, in any depth here the sort of shot doctrine that our warfighter uh, uh, employs today in order to assure ourselves that we're going to reliably uh, uh, defend our nation. But needless to say that if he's going to sh have to shoot interceptors, since we use hit-to-kill technology against credible objects, then it would be important for us to uh, reduce the number of credible objects, as well as the shots that we take against each credible object. And so that's where we're focusing our technology now in those, in those particular areas. We want to find a way to uh, reduce the number of shots that we take at each credible object. And we do that by several ways. One is we, we look at ways that we can improve the reliability of the interceptors we have today. And that's one of the bets we're making in this year's budget, is looking at ways that we can do that for our ground-based and mid-course defense system. We also look at the possibility of uh, bringing more capability to each interceptor by adding more kill vehicles to each one of those interceptors. In other words, instead of taking several shots, uh, being able to take one shot with several kill vehicles against that particular object. And then if you think about the probabilities of uh, reliability there, our effectiveness goes up in that way. Our system today uh, as you probably know, is uh, beyond the, the missile warning syst uh, message that we get from our overhead uh, sensor systems in, in space, is primarily a terrestrial radar-based system. So all of the sensing that we do, the tracking of the missiles that, that come, are based on the ship-based sensors, the sea-based X-band radar, and our, uh, our, our other terrestrial radars, including early warning radar, uh, and uh, our, what we call our TIPI-2, or our, uh, or our x band radar that, do, that does discrimination. And so all of that is what we base uh, our decisions on in terms of how we launch our interceptors and on what path we launch our interceptors. For very long-range systems, like the Homeland Defense System, where we expect an ICBM to travel a very long distance, you can imagine how challenging it would be to get a terrestrial radar all along the path of that ICBM, especially if you might envision a rate of ICBMs that would take different paths. And so uh, the challenge of the Earth's curvature and these radar systems then brings us to uh, the, the issue of how do we find a way to more reliably track from birth to death these incoming uh, ballistic missiles. So our vision is to do a couple of things. One is to bring new phenomenology. In other words, gain more knowledge about what this system looks like, what the ballistic missile raid looks like. Um, by bringing additional sensors into this, into this architecture. And not only radar systems, but systems uh, that use electro-optical phenomenology in, in order to determine more about that, uh, about that system. So you can imagine the power of having much greater knowledge, especially knowledge that is relevant to the same sort of sensors that are our, on our interceptor kill vehicles. Uh, we want to get more knowledge about that system, and we want to understand it from birth to death so that we can discriminate and determine which are the two objects that we ought to be shooting at. And so getting a more capable discrimination system here now would be a way to improve uh, the number of uh, shots that we have to take or reduce the number of shots that we have to take by reducing the number of things that we might consider to be a credible object. So our vision here uh, in the technology exploration now is to look at ways to bring electro-optical sensors into this architecture beyond that OPIR sensor, that, uh, that missile warning sensor that kicks these things off. And we're going to do that by capitalizing on uh, the work that's being done in industry today, both on sensors as well as on uh, building unmanned aerial vehicles that fly at very high altitudes. A high altitude platform is also key to one of the other investments we want to make. And so if we go back just a few years here, we made a big bet on airborne lasers in the, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. 
And that system that we built, although it was very effective in doing that one particular job we had for it, which is proving that you could shoot down a, uh, a, a rocket at the speed of light using light. A tremendous accomplishment. Uh, uh, although it proved impractical from an operational standpoint, you can imagine having a fleet of 747s flying about 33,000 feet with a laser system in them. There's a lot of challenges to that. Uh, but what we know now uh, from that is the next time we do this work, we're going to be looking at, uh, at getting above the known atmosphere where the aerosols won't affect the lasers and at altitudes where uh, the turbulence is significantly lower. So we want to find a regime that's high above the 33,000 feet. For all of us who fly uh, on 747s on a regular basis here, we know that it can get pr pretty shaky at 33,000 feet uh, almost any time of the year, depending on where you're flying. And so we want to make that uh, more like 60,000 feet. Uh, get to the stratosphere, where it'll be a much calmer uh, place for us to work. We're making investments in, uh, in laser technology today that's both in our national laboratories and in our, um, in our industry that goes beyond those chemical lasers that we looked at earlier to new solid state electric lasers which will be much more effective, efficient, effective as well I believe, uh, and ones that we can scale up and reduce the size of the laser necessary to get that job done. If we can find a way to make that happen, and we believe these technologies will lead us there, that we'll be able to, uh, excuse me, to get those uh, uh, lasers on an unmanned aero platform at very high altitudes and make that, uh, make that case for the entire logistics and infrastructure which goes along with that uh, much, much more simpler and make the technical challenges uh, less daunting than, uh, than they have been in the past. Mentioned earlier, uh, it might have been during our discussion at lunch, that uh, there are other areas which we want to go back to, and, and so I'm sort of going back to my past in this one. Um, we left the railgun in uh, 1989 because there were challenges with getting a railgun and the idea that we would build a new launch infrastructure that would get these uh, 2,000 uh, uh, or 100-ton uh, satellites in orbit with railguns on them was, uh, was not achievable. However, the, uh, the services have been making investments in bringing that technology along primarily for uh, close-in engagements and primarily for uh, long-range uh, fires. And so as they continue to develop that technology, we're looking at that as a possible uh, way to get at some of our missile defense challenges. Again, having a magazine which is uh, very, very cheap projectiles uh, with the capability of, of uh, electrically generating the power uh, makes it uh, possible for us to get away from this challenge that we find in terms of expensive interceptors against other, uh, other rocket systems. So our goal ultimately is then to find a way to get more capable sensors into the architecture to improve the knowledge that we have from birth to death of this launch and to uh, reduce the number of credible objects by understanding what objects are there, with the ultimate goal of, a, of reducing the objects dramatically uh, by destroying the rocket booster in the boost phase. That will revolutionize the capability for missile defense and dramatically change the calculus of any of our adversaries. We're working today with industry, we're working with academia, and we're working in our national laboratories to make that vision come true. We're shifting uh, our, the, the overall balance in our investments this year, which had been primarily focused on increasing capacity over the last few years for our regional missile defense systems, and looking now at shifting the balance uh, somewhat, ramping over the next couple of years to get at the advanced technology challenges that we're going to need to build that foundation for the missile defense architecture I just spoke of. We hope to have that here in the next, uh, in the next decade based on those investments. We recognize that just like in the past, it will be a challenging uh, endeavor and that we may not uh, rush forward with continual success towards that goal, 
but we are excited about having you as partners uh, and, uh, and making that a true reality over the next 10 years. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Arch Macy, and um, now a private consultant. Uh, as many of you know, had a background in some of this for a few years. Um, if you don't like the ballistic missile defense review, you can blame me. I've heard it before, but go ahead. Um, I was one of the co-authors. Um, I'd like to talk about missile defense and thinking about next steps in missile defense from a somewhat different, uh, perhaps, uh, look at Rubik's Cube. This panel was about is about future directions, it sort of was titled. And so the question I'm thinking about is what are the future elements of missile defense that need to be developed, melded with each other, and demonstrated and made known to potential antagonists? Let me develop that for a moment. We've talked today a lot about intercept activities. There's been some comment on left of launch. So I'll phrase the question this way, what is the right of launch activities and plans other than that of intercept? My basic premise is that the missile defense system that is generated by MDA and the services does not and cannot provide the overall defense of the nation against ballistic missile threats. We acknowledge for the moment that the, a massive attack from China or Russia the only response is in kind, and that has long been our explicit policy and will not change unless there is some breakthrough in physics, which no one expects. But that's the everything else. Um, we've talked earlier about defending against ballistic missiles cannot be an inventory challenge. You're always going to lose. There's always going to be more interceptors, excuse me, more threats than our interceptors. So at some point, in addition, the laws of physics the laws of probability and statistics say that even as you are taking on incoming threats, some are going to get through. I mean, there's no system is 100%. Uh, I'm an aerospace engineer by trade and by experience, and you hate to admit that, but you know you can't build a perfect system. So there's no way I can assure somebody that I can get them all, even if I did have the inventory. So why do we have a BMDS? Well, obviously, destruction of the threat is a part of what you need to do. What the BMDS capability does is to provide the protection of critical assets long enough that the National Command Authority, the President and our leadership, can take steps to end the threat by other means, get them to stop launching. If they don't launch, it's not a threat. As Rich pointed out, if we can get them on launch, that's great. At some point there, I would submit that particularly in the short and intermediate range um, scenarios, you're going to run out of boost phase interceptors or whatever your te technique may be. And boost phase to me can include directed energy, light, railgun. I'm agnostic as to the technique. So the question is, what, what does this thing need to do? The ballistic missile defense system, that capability produced by MDA and the services, has to buy time and it affords time to the leadership to take other actions and to make decisions. And they're going to have to happen in pretty short order. It gives the NCA the chance to choose other methods. All of the elements of national power, the classic four that you learn in war college, diplomatic, information, military, and economic, and using all of them in whatever way is appropriate to get the threat to cease to occur. The strategic necessity is to protect the homeland, our own forces, friends, and allies from ballistic missile attack. So the key word there is it's about protection. It's not about just flight destruction. So ballistic missile protection planning must encompass a continuum of capabilities, plans, lines of authority and communications, and training to negate or interrupt the ballistic missile threat sequence from its threat planning to preparation to targeting to launch to subsequent launches. So I submit that perhaps an idea for future discussion is that what we need is a ballistic missile protection plan of which the ballistic missile defense system is an element. 
This to achieve and maintain a comprehensive all of government approach to negate potential or actual ballistic missile threats. Today we've been talking a lot about systems. We started off with the SDI concept of ways to protect us from the missiles, to protect us from the warheads. That's a kinetic approach to people like me in the Department of Defense. That's where we tend to go to. We grew up that way. As I said, I'm an aerospace engineer, and so I think like that. So since the advent of even the SDI concept, it's been focused, we've been focused on developing and fielding the capability to perform threat negation by intercept or destruction in flight. So, but we know that we can't keep doing that because we'll lose the inventory gain. It's clear that MDA owns the intercept part of ballistic missile protection. Who owns the rest? Do they know that they do? Do others know who owns what? And then the question is, what is the rest? What are the methods, the techniques by which you're going to get an antagonist to stop launching? Now, it can range from the absolutely terrifying to perhaps something less. I'll go back to that in a bit. But that range of actions needs to be thought about and understood, developed to prevent launch in the first place or to prevent subsequent launches, and melded with each other to provide an effective and understood comprehensive protection. You have to do this ahead of time. The longest flight time of a ballistic missile is the ICBM range at something around 40 minutes. So assuming that it's a one after the other, the best time you have is 40 minutes. It is probable, depending on what you think the inventories of limited number launches may be, that the ballistic missile defense system could provide protection to a certain level for hours to maybe a day or two. That's how long you have in order to accomplish another effect to end the launches. So as I said, what capabilities need to be developed to prevent the launch, to prevent subsequent launches? Something that will have to be considered at some point is who is responsible for the attribution that can be made public to explain what you're doing in an unchallengeable manner? Who knows where it came from? Well, we know where it came from within the BMDS and the overhead sensor systems. We usually tend to be loath to put too much accuracy into our reports on that. But in the case where you're going to take action now, at some level you're going to have to convince the world as well as your antagonist, that in fact they are the ones doing it and you know where it's coming from and you can prove it. So, we need a comprehensive basis for BMD protection. It can't be intercept alone. The overarching goal, as I said, has to be to deter or prevent launch in the first place and if the launch occurs, to inflict sufficient pressure to end further launches and do so in a timely manner. We need to determine what constitutes effective deterrence to dissuade an antagonist from launching based on two principles that a potential antagonist must be led to understand. First, the attack will not succeed in its objective and that the penalty for the attempt will be too high to be borne. This is not a new concept. It's the basic statement of any deterrent strategy. The challenge for our discussion is what are the steps, the factors, the plans and capabilities necessary to accomplish these two principles in defending against ballistic missiles. The first principle is addressed in prime by the ballistic missile defense system, the intercept destruction capability. The second has to be addressed by a variety of means depending on the situation. BMD planning, I believe, will have to count for different categories of attack. I put them into four sectors or judgment, existential, a violent statement, a rogue, or an accident. An existential attack, which against the United States would at this time be provided only by China or Russia, we have a declaratory policy on how we will respond. We are, have been clear on that for many, many years. That is not a function of BMD protection per se. A violent statement by an antagonistic state a number of missiles, a limited attack, a rogue, an attack of a limited number of missiles are two different conditions. The rogue issue being who do you pressure? If it's a violent state, if it's an act of state X, 
then you can pressure state X. You can figure out how to do that, one would hope. If it's a rogue attack, and I would pick ISIS as a classic, how and where do you pressure? If ISIS gets its hands on MRBMs and uses them against Europe, what is the pressure point? What can we do about that? In some cases, the answer may be no, which will then affect your response. I'll get back to that. And then you have the accidental one. And then how is that communicated? If an accidental launch occurs, how does the owner of the missile prior to launch tell you, I'm very sorry and it wasn't me and it won't happen again? And he may be right or he may be faking it. If anyone remembers the somewhat terrifying novel, Seven Days in May, and what the president had to agree to do at the end of it to end thermonuclear war. That's a very hard decision. And then how do these questions differ between homeland defense and regional? Are you going to, when a launch comes at you, a limited attack, are you going to take a massive, violent kinetic attack on that nation? It may be appropriate. It may not be, because then you run into issues of escalatory response. So we need to consider and pre-plan our responses to these other types of attack. As I said, and I think I bring it up again, there's a limited timeline here. When this happens, we can't then summon the first National Security Council meeting about it. And going back to what I mentioned about all of the government, whole of government part, is that the Defense Department tends to be very, very good at planning. They do branches and sequels, they do con plans and O plans and all that kind of thing. The government as a whole does not, but you're going to have to have an interleaved way of economic pressure, political pressure, diplomatic pressure, steps that you're going to take, and they've got to work together to be maximum, maximally effective. As I said, one of the differences between ballistic missiles and other kinetic threats, particularly for the homeland, is the time span from first action to warhead arrival is shorter than other threats. Cruise missiles, bombers, sea and land forces, all are viewable in hours to days before arrival. You can take steps to crank things up. But once the first launch has occurred, inbound is in less than 40 minutes. So we have to have a method of response that starts to apply effective pressure in hours to a very few number of days. The capabilities and actions across the spectrum of necessary responses and responders must be prepared, equipped, and trained before the threat situation develops to the point of requiring action. Putting together all the elements, the dime elements. The plan will need to consider, particularly in the area of regional defense, the interaction with allies and partners and how their actions, decisions, capabilities might play in our assistance of their defense or how it may limit our ability depending on what choices they have to make. NATO, for instance, has a very detailed BMD plan for the intercept element of missile defense protection of NATO territory in Europe. What are other elements that the NATO alliance can bring to bear against an antagonist? They are a military alliance, after all. They are not the EU. What sort of connections and relations with the EU, the economic deciders of Europe, need to be in, um, engendered in order to come up with an effective response? In the interleaving of these capabilities, do they fall under the NATO command structure or some other entity? The EU, Council of Governments, unclear. Uh, earlier, we were talking about exchanging information. Frank mentioned that. How do you coordinate this with other allies and partners? Some of this can be very sensitive. But again, some of it needs to be planned and thought of ahead of time. Do we need to extend the concept of the phased adaptive approach to the whole of ballistic missile protection and not just intercept capability? So, having asked all those questions and posited challenge. I have a recommendation. I warned Elaine about this before she had to leave. She smiled. I recommend that the, we extend the BMDR, the Ballistic Missile Defense Review, not as a revisit but as an extension to encompass the whole of government approach, to allocate responsibilities and tasks, and define the deterrent points that need to be made and demonstrated 
to all who might consider threatening our homeland, forces, allies, and partners. In other words, to provide a ballistic missile protection plan. There have been and are still ongoing studies and plans addressing different elements of providing protection, including non-kinetic, non-military. But I think it's time now to bring those disparate ideas and analysis together. And again, as happened in the 2010 BMDR, to use a cross-government, interagency, consultative approach. And it really was, and I had the pleasure of taking part in it, much more so than I had experienced at any other time in the government, to interleave the knowledge and capabilities of this requisite approach. I do submit that the original premises and results of the 2010 BMDR remain valid. However, I believe it is time now to extend its scope and direction to the whole of ballistic missile protection. With that, I'll close and look forward to your questions. Thanks. Well, thank you, thank you gentlemen. Uh, I think this was, uh, this was very thought-provoking. Um, I think I'll start off with a question for Mr. Matlock. Um, you laid out, and in the news, really in the past week, there's been a lot of discussion of R&D and, and that sort of thing for MDA. Uh, but you laid out several key technologies. You talked about space for both sensing and, and other things. Uh, you talked about um, fast interceptors, multiple kill vehicles, things like that, airborne laser. Um, first of all, I was hoping you might address, you know, what kind, what, what's the, what, what has been the fruit of these past investments, number one? Um, speak to that. Uh, has this just been experiments that we've yielded nothing from, or, it, you know, what kinds of things uh, have they uh, given us now that makes the future possible? And then, frankly, also, um, given the relative reduction of MDA's budget for R&D, how are we going to be able to do with current budget levels or during the FIDEP lower budget levels, do these more uh, impressive uh, types of capabilities? Okay. Well, I think that what you, what you see in our, as I mentioned a little bit earlier here, what you see in our system today is essentially the results of the technology investments that we made in the 80s and the, and the 90s. Uh, and so much of the interceptor systems, the, uh, the, the command and control system, the, um, uh, the sensor network, uh, all of those things are a result of uh, uh, investments that we made uh, uh, broadly in, in that time frame. Uh, Elaine likes to use the, uh, the seed corn analogy here, and so, uh, we ate a lot of our seed corn to get that, and, uh, and in order to, uh, to respond to the capacity, the, re the, you know, the requirement for greater capacity across the, um, uh, across the, uh, the uh, regions, uh, we've, uh, we've had to, uh, to transition that technology and make those investments. Um, and so what, uh, whenever you're faced with uh, the, the sort of fiscal realities uh, that we face today in terms of uh, uh, those, th that balance of technology, uh, capacity versus capability, and the need to uh, look across government for how do we, uh, how do, we do that in sequestration, uh, then uh, it tends to focus the mind a bit more on those things which are, uh, have the most promise uh, and, uh, and perhaps uh, leave, uh, leave those, uh, the, the remainder to uh, to future investigations. So that that uh, that roadmap that I laid out for you earlier here, Tom, is uh, based on some hard uh, hard thinking and some hard choices that we made within the agency, as well as with our partners uh, in the warfighting community uh, and in the acquisition uh, community, and uh, and uh, with policy. So uh, we we think that we've that we've got a uh, a roadmap now. That is uh, going to get us on a path to uh, to make those those uh, those improvements and enhancements in the missile defense capability over the next few years. I take uh, Arch's point in terms of we probably need to go beyond just that right of launch uh, look, and so we'll be looking um, uh, probably with greater consideration this year at how we uh, how we start to broaden beyond that. Great. Well, let me, um, I think, turn to you, Admiral Macy. Uh, I really like your extend the BMDR uh, uh, approach. It kind of reminds me, frankly, uh, I think it was the 2002 National Strategy for Countering WMD. Mm -hmm. 
um, which had those several uh, pillars or what have you, and I don't think that was updated. There has been update, although of course our national strategy has been, uh, been updated since then, um, which dealt with consequence management response and all, and all that sort of thing. Um, this seems to be really, the, this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of really maturing how we think about missile defense. How far along, just, just so we you know, have some clarity about, in, in terms of thinking and, and acting merely in terms of that missile sponge, that, that catcher's mitt as it were, how far along are we right now to, to integrating those missile defense capabilities and plans to everything else? We've heard all day in a way how this is just one piece of our larger national, and I think the, the BMD uh, ballistic missile protection plan uh, that you articulate is, is a further step. But how, first of all, how, how far along are we there? I don't think we're very far along, which is why I posited the idea. Um, that stuff's been talked about many times, um, how you put, it's a classic problem of how you put whole of government approaches together. It's always hard to do. Uh, I try to uh, argue that in the case of responding to ballistic missile defense events, to, to ballistic missile events, the timeline is much shorter than almost any other event occurrence factor when you have more than one launch. So you don't have days or weeks or months, much less to say, okay, this is how I'm gonna respond. Um, you know, the other end of it was a, uh, of such a thing would be the classic um, force on force event that hurt, occurred in Desert Storm. And we took, we had, we had the luxury of months to prepare our response. You're not going to have that here. So therefore you have to build your capability, exercise your capability, train the people in it much further ahead of time and maintain that level of training, that level of capability. My observation is we really don't have that um, because this will encompass actions that certainly the Department of Defense will take, which is what General Todorov and others are responding, rich are responsible to do. But, uh, and NORTHCOM, NORAD, CENTCOM, PACOM is appropriate. But it's also going to involve actions that the State Department are going to have to take, Justice Department, Treasury, Commerce, because you're going to need to apply pressure in a number of different ways in order to change the behavior of your antagonist. And I don't believe that we are very far along at doing that now. If, if we had to do it tomorrow, it would be um, a significant pickup game. Excellent. Um, shall we go to the uh, audience questions, especially on the technology and the, uh, you might say, the full spectrum responses, um, I guess, right here? Good afternoon. Charles Newstead, State Department. Speaking just for myself, this is a physicist and not for the department or Mr. Carey will fire me. I'll be always doing a great job. Um, two points. In terms of the technology, uh, Mr. Matlock talked about the various systems that we could have either on terrestrially or in space. And as he pointed out, developing a capability in the satellites to shoot things down would be certainly better if we could do it. Now, in particular, laser interests me because those are coming along very quickly. One, not quite there yet, we don't have a laser that would, uh, we can direct and quickly take out uh, uh, an incoming attack. But the point is that you mentioned uh, dialed pumped uh, solid state lasers, which are coming along very quickly now, and may be what we need. Now, we've got to be concerned that this capability is being developed in a number of countries. The United States is doing it, and so is, uh, are the French for their stockpiled stewardship programs, as you understand. But that doesn't have the strength that we need to uh, knock out a missile. So the point. What's the question? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'll get to the question. The question is this. Because China and Russia are both, Russia at Sarov and China in their uh, defense establishment, are developing what they call, Russia, the Chinese call divine light, and what the Russians call, I forgot the name, but it, these are supposed to be even stronger than what we had at NIF and at uh, Laser Megajoule. So if the, ch well, I'm sorry, I'll get to the point. It's, it's a, a long road I'm trying to travel here. The main point is, 
how do we defend against the Chinese and the Russians? Because they may well have the capability of developing these lasers before right. we do, since they can see at so, this so point. Other, other, other people doing directed energy as well. Mm -hmm. You want to speak to that? Um, it, it, we're developing these systems, but they can, uh, other folks are developing directed energy as well. Any comment on that? Well, uh, I hope we're going to. Hope we're moving more quickly. Uh, no, I, so I don't mean to be flippant, but um, I think what we see uh, here in the in the last uh, last uh, five or six years is we were very successful in the airborne laser in terms of proving uh, the physics uh, and proving that uh, it w we could uh, generate the power necessary to shoot down uh, shoot down rockets. Uh, our big challenge there was that it was operationally impractical. Uh, because of the nature of the, of, uh, of, uh, of the system. So we're looking at the technologies that the gentleman suggested there, the diode pumped alkali laser system, which is uh, primarily focused at uh, our, our national laboratory in, in California. We're also looking at another concept, uh, the, a fiber combined laser, along with our DARPA and, and uh, Air Force uh, teammates, and looking at, uh, at scaling those up. And so we're finding that uh, the technology is moving along uh, fairly quickly. Uh, we won't be at, uh, at uh, lethal uh, capability here for some years to come, but uh, we're hopeful that we'll be able to focus that research here uh, along with uh, bringing our industry uh, into, the, uh, into the picture very shortly to help us understand uh, how we might transition that technology then to an effective missile defense system that could perform a number of missile uh, defense functions. Do you want to talk about the FY16 UAV? Proposal, the, the uh, pr proposal for a laser mount on a UAV that was alluded to? Yeah, so we have, um, we've asked, we've seen in the last uh, couple of years, as I mentioned, uh, uh, great, uh, great improvements in these two laser systems. We also know that, uh, that our partners uh, at ONR have been uh, demonstrating lasers on, uh, on, on ships for, for a particular mission. Um, and the Army has uh, done some great work down at the White Sands Missile Range for, uh, for counter martyr with lasers. And so uh, we want to take the, the research that we've got in the laboratory as well as the research that's going on today in our, in our, uh, in our industry uh, and look at the possibility of whether or not we can transition more quickly to, a, to an airborne laser demonstrator here over the next four years. And so we've made, uh, uh, made uh, some bets in our budget and we'll be uh, awarding contracts shortly with uh, industry to look at what that inter what that excuse me what that laser demonstrator might look like and how we might be able to put it together and on what timeline. Great. Other folks. Mike. Hi, Mike Groose with Space News. I was wondering if you could uh, this question is from Mr. Matlock. If you could elaborate a little bit more about the sensor network and uh, what you might gain from that and. and uh, what kind of timeline there might be for that? Which sensor network? Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, he, there was talk earlier about, um, I guess, a... Space-based? Right, space-based uh, sensor network that might be a little more elaborate than, I guess, what currently exists. So uh, what, we're, what we're doing right now is looking at uh, uh, space for, under, in the current fiscal environments, uh, access to space for for our research has been challenging. And so what we've been looking at is uh, other, uh, other modalities that we can use then to demonstrate the technology that ultimately we might want to put, on, uh, uh, put in space. Uh, and so uh, we have uh, right now a program that we're working to, uh, uh, to modify some of our uh, unmanned aerial vehicles with this, uh, with this new sensor capability. Uh, and looking at doing that in the field, we had some success uh, just this past uh, uh, fall at uh, the Pacific Missile Range facility in conjunction with some of our Aegis uh, ballistic missile defense t uh, tests in which we, uh, we took a, uh, a, a EOIR sensor that's being used in the field today uh, for, uh, for other purposes um, mounted it on the front of a uh, Reaper unmanned aerial vehicle and, and moved the capability uh, forward so that we could track missiles uh, uh, up in the atmosphere as opposed to look at targets on the ground. And uh, with, uh, with a stereo tracking capability with those uh, Reapers, we found that we could uh, 
generate the kind of track quality necessary to launch standard missiles against targets, targets that were launched uh, there at uh, PMRF. We have a, a, a tech plan now to look at increasing that capability over the next few years with the primary goal of looking at the sensor capability as opposed to the platform and then making a decision down the road depending on the success of that sensor uh, whether or not this is something we would uh, consider deploying in space uh, or whether it's something that uh, makes sense to deploy a, a terrestrial on unmanned aircraft. Yes, sir. Hi, Scott Mazzioni from inside the Pentagon. Uh, I just wanted to go back to the airborne uh, laser on the uh, drones. Um, how do you reconcile that with uh, that it will be attacking the missiles in the booster phase and it'll take a while, they'll have to be in enemy airspace, deal with enemy fire, and the lasers probably won't be powerful enough to destroy uh, you know, the missile instantaneously? I'm sorry, what was the question? I didn't, I didn't catch the last part of that. How, how can you, it, the, the laser won't be able to destroy it instantaneously, the, the missile, when it's in the boost phase. Mm -hmm. You know, it would, it would at least take a little while until the, the missile is destroyed. So, you know, how are you going to protect these drones uh, in an enemy environment while they're shooting down a boost phase missile? So I'm going to leave that, uh, that CONOPS question up to uh, my partners in the Air Force. But, but uh, what, what my, my job uh, here and what my goal is, is to prove that uh, we can make the, the technology work. Uh, at extended ranges, uh, so uh, you know our goal would be rather than tens or hundreds of kilometers to get much longer uh, range capability out of these lasers. So that's uh, why I'm driving at these more efficient electric lasers to be able to scale them up to uh, to greater power, uh, and so that we can laser at longer ranges and get more more energy on target, which would reduce the time that you've just talked about that we'd have to spend lasing each target. So the goal from a technology standpoint is to, is to get a more efficient laser that's more powerful at longer range over time. And we're, of course, uh, one of the, the challenges we're looking at here with this laser demonstrator is then taking it to the field and working with our warfighter uh, compadres on, uh, on what would be a reasonable CONOPS as we look at missile defense missions that use directed energy. All right. Uh, well, I have another question actually for, for Admiral Macy. Uh, you, as you talk about uh, integrating these things and uh, frankly thinking about integrating them uh, more heavily, also to buy time uh, for these, what, what's the role of, of working with our allies on that? To what extent, I mean, the QDR talks about uh, you know, one of the, the pillars being working with uh, our partners and, and allies. Um, on the missile defense mission, how reliant or is the United States going to be on our own capabilities? And how much are, are working and in, in integrating with, and becoming interoperable with other folks in the Middle East, Asia Pacific, uh, uh, and, and NATO? What, what, I think what, it's, what do you um, envision there? It's a continual effort. It's to uh, get more and more reliant and more and more capable of working together. I mean, NATO has, has done this already. Uh, the decision was taken to uh, make ballistic missile defense a mission of NATO. And then further, that the, the ballistic missile defense plans, the rules of engagement, the defended asset list and everything were agreed upon at 28 in NATO, uh, which is as complete as you're going to get. And that by perforce means that some areas get more protection than others, but they all agreed to it. Um, so you work with your allies and partners for a number of reasons. One is, particularly in the cases where you have treaties, you have a responsibility to them. I mean, NATO is probably the most classic and the fullest one of, of Article 5, where an attack on one is an attack on all. So we are fully reliant on our systems. One is by definition. And then you are reliant on other people's systems to the greatest degree that they can provide them and you can agree to them with it. There is certainly a matter of trust. You want your allies involved, not only because you have a responsibility to them, as they do to you, for joint defense and for cooperative defense, but for whatever assets they can bring to the table, whatever capabilities, not just military, but economic and whatever. Um, a completely off the wall, but not necessarily idea, is have part of the declared response policy that if a launch comes from a nation that the other nations, the, the other economic power nations, which would be the United States 
and Europe and uh, Japan, Australia, and so forth, would immediately shut down all banking transactions. I mean, that, that, that would render any modern country essentially inoperable in something on the order of 24 hours because the world is so interconnected on banking. So if that becomes part of what you would do, that would be part of a cooperative agreement where allies and partners could join in with providing this effect. Good. Other folks? We're all well, between let's, them let's and Let's mix Jupiter. it up a little bit. Uh, let's, let's mix. Actually, I, I, you know, earlier you asked about the, the, the laser technology. I'd like to, to go back and, frankly, this is for both of you. Um, this was referred to earlier today, the, uh, the Greeners and Odierno memo about reassessing our strategy. I think you've spoken to that uh, to some extent. Um, I'd, I'd like to comment on that. I, well, I'm, I'm giving you the opportunity to comment on that. Um, comment on the memo. It said a couple things. It talked about um, uh, budget constraints. It talked about really the increasing stress on the services mm -hmm. for the missile defense mission. Uh, and we heard earlier about, of course, sequestration. Uh, that affects everything. Uh, it affects Northern Command and Homeland Defense, and it affects uh, others. So go at it. The reason that I'm personally convinced that that memo was written by the two primary providers of BMD capability among the services was that those two officers were fulfilling their professional and legal obligation. When you are a commissioned officer in command, you are responsible to keep your superiors advised on your ability or lack thereof to perform an assigned mission. It doesn't matter whether you like the mission or not. I didn't read that memo as saying that the BMD policy was wrong. I read the memo as the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Chief of Naval Operations were telling the Secretary of Defense, sir, I don't think I can do what you want me to do, so something's got to change, the mission or the resources. But they were doing what one has to do in that position. In fact, they would have been seriously at fault had they not done so. Very good, very good. Um, I'm going to keep going. Um, I'd like to, to kick back to uh, uh, the MKV, multi-volume kill, and now the M, uh, MOKV, multiple object. What, what's, the, what's the real potential, the long-term potential for miniaturization of kill vehicles? Um, whether it's on today's interceptors or whether it's in, on something else. What's the, what's the long-term potential for miniaturization there? Well, we've been through, uh, through several cycles of miniaturization, and, uh, and let me kind of give you a feel for where we're at. I mentioned earlier that we had taken this refrigerator-sized uh, kill vehicle and shrunk it down to the size of a bread box. Uh, and that, that was primarily what got us the capability to turn the standard missile from the Navy parlance into a ballistic missile defender. Um, uh, and that, that system uh, is probably about the right size for what we need to get done. The last time we looked at uh, uh, the MKV program, our goal uh, then was to look at a very large number of interceptors on a, on a single uh, booster. We were talking in the order of 24, 25. Um, as we improve our sensing network and improve our capability to discriminate, the need to have 25, uh, 25 kill vehicles on a single rocket uh, is certainly uh, uh, less necessary than, than what we would have perceived before. Uh, and we weren't uh, striving for that, that kind of, we don't need to strive for that capability now. So my perception is, is that, uh, uh, that we will probably need some miniaturization uh, this next go around. I don't think it's the uh, two orders of magnitude that we achieved uh, from uh, from the uh, HO experiment to the elite projectile, but uh, there's some work that we need to do there. I think as we look at our RKV and uh, the way we formulated the, uh, the new, uh, re I'm sorry, I'm speaking in acronyms, but the new uh, kill vehicle uh, improved reliability is we're looking at modular open system architecture there that would allow us to bring new uh, systems in to broaden the vendor space as well for our, uh, for our contractors so that, in other words, if you can design to this particular interface and have this uh, set of, meet the set of requirements, then you're a, you're a new vendor for the missile defense integrator. 
uh, that will allow us to bring more, uh, more to bear on that, on that challenge. And so I think it's a combination of how do, we, uh, how do we bring a little bit more capability, perhaps a little bit more miniaturization, but I don't perceive it as going from, uh, from 1 to 26. I perceive this probably going from 1 to some number of much less than 26 in this next go around. We're, uh, we'll probably make inv be making investments uh, this coming year looking at how do we go from an RKV to, an, to a, a MOKV, a multi-object kill vehicle, and we'll be looking at, uh, at uh, our industry partners to help us, uh, help us decide what that, what that, what's required to make that leap. Good. Any other comments from, uh, from either of you folks or anybody else? Twitter. Uh, 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 you're go, like, for example, you're going to Poland. Uh, hi, you're going to Poland, right? Who measures what? Because I, I, I'm looking at it from the host nation standpoint, and who sells that? Or are you guys just R and D or the environmental well, assessment? I, I think I think these gentlemen are mainly speaking to future directions more than the political considerations for hosting and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, any final thoughts? Um, th things that haven't been, been, been brought out, you want to get off? No, I think it's been a very interesting conference. Um, my only encouragement would be, um, again, from my obviously demonstrated somewhat parochial viewpoint, is, is that we continue to look at the fact that we have to do more than provide a kinetic answer to an inbound threat. Hearing a lot, hearing a lot about that, and I think there's a lot of nodding heads on that. Well, I think, I think we've reached our, our, our conclusion. I want to thank both of you gentlemen for this. I also absolutely want to thank our, our sponsor, the Boeing Company, for, for making this possible, for making uh, larger work on missile defense possible. And uh, we'll hopefully be continuing this conversation in the coming months. So thank you all for coming out. Thank you.